Has the infamous RT-PCR test been weaponized by a powerful group of globalist elites who want you to carry around a health passport and eat bugs? Well, no one can deny its massive impact on society over the past few years. It was used to drive the global health crisis, including lockdowns, business closures, school closures, various health-related mandates, the introduction of V-passports, quarantines, loved ones dying alone in hospitals and nursing homes. This one actually hits close to home, but I'll save that story for another video. Healthy athletes being disqualified from competition. Remember this? John Rahm forced to withdraw from Memorial Tournament with a six-shot lead? Ugh. The myth of asymptomatic infection and all the hysteria that that caused? And most recently, to justify the destruction of over 58 million poultry birds bringing eggs from basic breakfast fare to status symbol of the upper class. What can I say? It's one of my desert island foods. I gotta have them. Hello everyone, I'm Scott. This is Shadow Records. Here we go. Let's take a look at this article from The Guardian from April of 2022. U.S. egg factory roasts alive 5.3 million chickens in avian flu call. Overnight, the factory had begun slaughtering more than 5 million chickens using a gruesome killing method after detecting a single case of avian flu. Think about that. One single infection to justify the destruction of 5.3 million chickens. From the USDA, as of March 3rd, 58.53 million birds affected. And by affected, they mean killed. Commercial flocks affected? 318. Backyard flocks affected, 459. So if you're someone who started raising chickens in your backyard to combat these high egg prices, I am on your side. But don't be surprised if the government comes knocking on your door. We can see from this USDA article, detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds, that the primary method of detection used is the RT-PCR test. Is this test truly the gold standard viral infection detector that our mainstream media and government agencies would have us believe? Not according to the inventor of the test, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Carrie Mullis. If, if they could find this virus in you at all, and with PCR, if you do it well, you can find almost anything in anybody, right? I mean, because if you can amplify one single molecule up to, a, to something that you can really measure, which PCR can do, then there's just very few molecules that you don't have at least one single one of them in your body, okay? With PCR, you can find almost anything in anybody. And I'll explain how in a bit. That was Carrie Mullis speaking at a panel discussion on the use of PCR in diagnosing HIV AIDS. He was opposed to the use of the test for that purpose. It, it allows you to take a very minuscule amount of anything and make it measurable and then talk about it in meetings and stuff like it is important. PCR is separate from that. It's just a process that's used to make a whole lot of something out of something. That's what also, it is. Um, but it's, but it's not, it doesn't tell you that you're sick and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. So with PCR, you can find almost anything in anybody and it doesn't tell you that you're sick. Those are pretty dangerous attributes for a test when you consider what that diagnosis could do to a person's life. Mullis surely would have been one of the most outspoken opponents of the PCR-driven health crisis narrative we've experienced over the past few years had he not died in August of 2019, only five months before it began. Coincidentally, I'm sure. Now, I don't want to lose those of you who are saying, why would I listen to a scientist who I've never seen on TV? For you, I present corroborating testimony from the god of science himself, Tony Fauci. Well, PCR doesn't measure replication-competent virus. It measures viral particles, nucleic acid. So, in other words, I could be infected, have cleared the replication-competent virus from me, but I can continue to be positive with a PCR for several days after recovering and not being transmissible at all. For several days and even weeks later, it doesn't give you any indication of whether or not you're transmissible. Several days and even weeks? Now, Fauci still seems to fudge the truth a bit by suggesting that having a dead or inactive virus on your person 
is the equivalent of being infected. I think that most scientists and lay people alike intuitively understand that that's not what's meant by infection. A viral infection is when an active virus is entering your cells and using those cells to replicate itself. Is this misrepresentation by Fauci a surprise? Again, not according to Nobel Prize winning scientist Carrie Mullis. Those guys have got an agenda, which is not what we would like them to have, being that we pay for them to take care of our health in some way. They've got a personal kind of agenda. They make up their own rules as they go. They change them when they want to. And they smugly, like Tony Fauci, does not mind going on television in front of the people that pay his salary and lie directly into the camera. Now we know how he rose to such heights in the government bureaucracy. Let's take a look at how the PCR test can really go off the rails. From Cole Palmer, vendor of the PCR test, we can see that the test involves a four-step process. Each iteration through that four-step process is called a cycle, and after each cycle, the genetic material contained in the sample has been doubled. For this example, let's assume the sample has a single fragment of DNA. After one cycle, we would have two copies. After two cycles, four copies. Believe it or not, after only 30 cycles, we would have over one billion copies of that original fragment. Was that one single molecule going to cause any harm? We know that a certain amount of viral load is required for an infection to take hold, so this seems like a very valid question. And they don't stop at 30. They just keep going. 31, 2 billion copies. 32, 4 billion. 34, 16 billion. And do they stop there? Nope. This particular lab will amplify the sample 35 to 40 times. But I've heard at the height of the global health crisis, many labs would go up to 45. And what about false positives? Now you may be thinking, wasn't that what we were just talking about? Actually, I would categorize those as meaningless positives. The test did detect the material in question, but that material was either inactive or in such a trace amount that it would have no real world impact. There are also consistent instances of false positives where the test just flat out gets it wrong. The following two studies investigate this phenomenon. This one published in The Lancet, December of 2020, False Positive Results, Hidden Problems and Costs. This one from the Royal College of Physicians, The Impact of False Positive Results in an Area of Low Prevalence. I'll put a link to all of the source material in the description of this video. Both studies reference this research posted on the UK government health website. What causes false positives? The last four describe various types of contamination during the testing process. This one is interesting as it cites a real world example. Even experienced national labs can be affected in early March 2020. Assays produced by the CDC were withdrawn after many showed false positives due to contaminated reagents. The first one is the most interesting to me. Other sources of DNA or RNA may have cross-reactive genetic material that can be amplified by the RT-PCR test. What do they mean by cross-reactions? This is basically mistaken identity. There was material in your sample that when amplified looked enough like what you were looking for to trigger a positive result, a false positive result. And with each amplification cycle, the likelihood of mistaken identity increases. So we've shown several ways in which the RT-PCR test can give a very misleading result. Meaningless positives, false positives due to contamination, and false positives due to mistaken identity. It seems Mullis was absolutely correct in questioning the validity of this test as a diagnostic tool. I think it's imperative that we ask, is this test being used appropriately in this so-called avian influenza epidemic? It seems to me that you could go out, test 100 birds in a given flock or geographic area, come up with a few false positives, and justify a massive cull. Clearly, more investigative journalism is needed on this topic, and we endeavor to do just that. From my vantage point, this test is hardly a gold standard. Is it simply a misunderstood tool that's been used incompetently and at times recklessly but with good intentions? Or has it been knowingly weaponized by an authoritarian elite who would like to take society in a particular dystopian direction? This is from The Guardian, 2010. UN urges global move to meat and dairy-free diet. Lesser consumption of animal products is necessary to save the world from the worst impacts of climate change. More recently from the World Economic Forum, why we need to give insects the role they deserve in our food systems. 
and of course, Bill Gates. Here he is on 60 Minutes. You're talking about changing everything in the economy. I mean, every aspect. In the, yeah, the so physical of, economy. Of what we can see right <laughs> now of us sitting around here, what specifically would be impacted? You know, the meat and the burger is a big deal. Now don't fret. Bill won't let you go hungry. Gates has invested in two companies making plant-based meat substitutes, Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat. Gates is also backing a company that's created an entirely new food source. This company, Nature's Find, is using fungi, and then they turn them into sausage and yogurt. Always so well invested for the future he's working to create. And finally, we have the World Health Organization salivating over another society-shaping opportunity. We must prepare for potential human bird flu pandemic. Look, we know there are numerous organizations who represent globalist interests who've been pushing for the end of animal agriculture for some time. These individuals and organizations have been working together for many years, and they have a tremendous amount of influence over government health agencies throughout the world. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been one of the largest contributors to the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is a United Nations agency. Gates has also worked closely with the World Economic Forum, and that organization has officially partnered with the United Nations on sustainable development initiatives. They're all on the same team. They represent a subset of the elite who want to transfer power from the elected governments of individual nations to an unelected world government. Now, to get the masses to buy into global government, you need global problems. And hence, the net zero carbon con was born. We must get to net zero human-caused carbon emissions to save the planet. Seems like a tall order considering it's what we exhale with every breath. But at least they're not as extreme as this UK government-funded think tank who believe we actually have to get to absolute zero. According to this chart from UK Fires, we'll have to end all commercial air travel. And although it's not mentioned on this chart, I'm assuming to get to absolute zero, the extinction of humanity may be required. Is all of this really to save the planet? Well, not for you and me. To save land and energy resources for them? Absolutely. I think the reason so many people have a hard time seeing through this con is that they can't comprehend the motive. As we've seen on TV shows and in movies and even real life trial coverage, one of the most important things a prosecutor must do in order to get a conviction is establish motive. We tend to have a hard time believing that someone committed a crime or a con if we don't understand the motive. I've laid out the high level motive and we will dig deeper into that topic in future videos. The United Nations, the World Health Organization, and NATO are several of the current world government entities. I'll be blunt. I believe these organizations are pushing for a dystopian future where the common citizens of the world will have far less freedom and far less access to food and energy resources. Resistance to this state of affairs will be managed with various surveillance and control mechanisms. Digital IDs to act as gatekeepers to every important service in your life. Healthcare, banking, transportation, food, social media. Tack on biometric surveillance, programmable central bank digital currencies, a social credit system, and you'll have very little recourse against your authoritarian rulers. Of course, under normal circumstances, no one in their right mind would sign up for any of this, so the implementation of these control systems will largely be driven by manufactured crises. And boy, is the RT-PCR test one hell of a tool for creating a manufactured crisis. Hey, when you're going to zero, it, you don't get to skip anything. That's how I see it. Please leave a comment. I'd love to know how you see it. If you've enjoyed this content, hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel for more. Again, I encourage you, go out there, help uncover these stories, share these stories, be the light that wrecks the shadows. See you soon.